In this video, we're going to talk about a different kind of a method for approaching simple harmonic motion problems. So you can see that in this simulation, we have a cart that is on four wheels and is attached to a spring, and it's oscillating back and forth. It looks like the motion might be simple harmonic motion, but as you know, uh, we need to show that it's simple harmonic motion, and so that's what we're going to do in this video. So to begin with, remember that the relationship we're always looking for to prove that something is undergoing simple harmonic motion is something like a equals minus omega squared x. The variables can change, but it has to look like that. So uh, to begin with, let's just take a traditional approach. We know that we've got some linear motion involved here, so let's look at the net force, F net equals MA, and we know we've got some rotational motion involved as well in the wheels, so let's look at torque net equals I alpha. Before we start writing down uh, equations, let's think about what the positive x direction is going to be. So I'm going to just pick this as my positive x direction, and in that case, we know that the spring force acting on the cart is going to be negative kx. Now, in the position shown, the cart is to the right of the dotted equilibrium line, and so we know that the spring force has to be to the left. The position of the cart, because it's to the right of the dotted e equilibrium line, is negative, and so if we uh, write down negative kx, that's going to give us a force that is to the left. Uh, meanwhile, the frictional force acting on the wheels is um, going to be determined uh, by the side of equilibrium that the cart is on. So to, to look at this example, we can see that if the cart is rolling to the right, then the wheels should be going around this way. Of course, if the cart is rolling to the right, it will also be slowing down, which means the rotation of the wheels will be slowing down. And for that to happen, there needs to be a force of static friction in this direction. Now, the cart could be to the right of equilibrium, but still be moving to the left back toward equilibrium. And in that case, the wheels would be going this way, but they'd have to be speeding up, and so the force of static friction would still be in this direction. So either way, the force of static friction is to the right. Now, it would be interesting for you, after you watch this video, to draw the cart on the other side of equilibrium and uh, write down, or draw the forces and write down the F net equals MA equation that you get on the other side of equilibrium, but we'll just do one side for this video. So when we go back to F net equals MA, we're gonna write down minus KX minus four FS, because there are four wheels, is equal to the mass of the system, which is gonna be the mass of the cart plus the for uh, the mass of the four wheels times acceleration. So there it is. And that's about all we can do on the, on the left-hand side there. So now let's look at torque net equals I alpha. If we consider just one of the wheels, then the torque acting on one of the wheels will be equal to Fs times R. That's going to be equal to I alpha. And um, let's just assume that the wheels are like disks, and so we'll we'll substitute in one-half mr squared for the rotational inertia. And we will assume that this is rolling without slipping. And so we can substitute a over r in for alpha. And then uh, cancel out all of the r's, and we'll get fs equals one-half ma. Now, one-half ma can be substituted in for fs on the left-hand side. And after some manipulation, we'll get A is equal to minus K over big M plus six times little m times X. And remember that that's exactly the relationship we need to see to know that we've got simple harmonic motion. So omega squared is equal to K over big M plus six times little m. And from here, if you wish to go on to find the period, you just need to remember that period is equal to two pi over omega, and you can finish the job. So we haven't done anything new yet. This is kind of the method we've been using all along, and now we're gonna make things a little bit more interesting. So let's start by writing down what the energy of the system is. So there's going to be a potential energy due to the fact the spring will be stretched or compressed, and there's also going to be some kinetic energy, which results from the uh, translational motion of the cart, 
and also uh, the translational motion of the wheels and the rotational motion of the wheels. So the energy is going to be 1 half kx squared, that's the spring potential energy, and plus 1 half big M plus 4 times little m times v squared, that's the translational kinetic energy, plus 4 times 1 half i omega squared, that's the rotational kinetic energy of the four wheels. Now we can substitute for i, 1 half mr squared, as we did before, and then remember that v is equal to omega r when the motion involves rolling without slipping. So when we make that substitution, we get an expression that looks a little bit complicated, but actually it can be simplified. And this is the final expression for the energy after combining some like terms. So let's take this expression for energy and think about it a little bit. So we know that the energy should be constant. Um, because the forces here are conservative. And so that means that the derivative of energy with respect to time should be equal to zero. So let's see what happens when we take the derivative of this expression with respect to time. Uh, don't forget that although we don't have any t's in this equation, x is a function of time, position is a function of time, and velocity is a function of time as well. So taking the derivative with respect to time, we get 2 times 1 half kx times dx dt. And the dx dt results from the chain rule, and it's a recognition of the fact that x is a function of time. And when you take the derivative of the second term, the same kind of thing happens. Uh, we take the derivative with respect to v, and then we use the chain rule and multiply by the derivative of v with respect to time. So um, as I said, we expect dE dt to be equal to zero. We can also recognize that dx dt is equal to v, and that dV dt is equal to a, and when we make all of those substitutions, we get something that's looking pretty nice. There are v's in both of the terms, so let me cancel those out, and rearranging, we get a is equal to minus k over big M plus six times little m times x. And uh, you might remember this exact expression from a sl few slides back, and that's a good sign. We, uh, we always hope to get the same answer when we solve a problem in two different ways. So now we have something of the form a is equal to minus omega squared x. Omega squared is equal to k over big M plus 6 times little m. And you can go from there. Same answer. So you might be thinking, wow, that was a nice trick, but will it really work in other contexts? And the answer is yes. So you, of course, remember uh, working through the example of the simple pendulum. What happens if we try to apply this energy technique to the simple pendulum? Well, the energy of the simple pendulum is going to be the potential energy, mgh, plus the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. And if we take the derivative of energy with respect to time, we have to recognize that h will be a function of time and v will be a function of time. And so uh, we get this expression. And uh, you might be tempted to say, well, gee, dh dt is probably v. But we have to be a little bit careful about that. So let's take a look at the pendulum. I'm going to draw v on the. Uh, on the diagram there, and uh, here are the components of V, and the, uh, the component that represents dH dt is really that vertical component of V. And uh, so we usually label the angle at the top of the pendulum theta, but this is a right angle here, and so this little angle in here is theta as well. And so what we find is that dh dt is equal to v sine theta. So let me make that substitution into the equation that we have. And um, note that now we can cancel velocities. We can also cancel some masses out. And we can remember that the derivative of energy with respect to time is 0. And finally, for small angles, we uh, sometimes make the approximation that sine theta is approximately equal to theta. So taking all of that together, uh, and also remembering that dv dt is equal to a, 
we get that uh, 0 is equal to g theta plus a. It's not looking too great, but um, remember that we can, uh, we can substitute uh, that, that a should be equal to alpha times r. Now, for a pendulum, we usually call the length of the pendulum L, so I'll, I'll substitute alpha L in for A. And now when I rearrange, I get alpha equals minus G over L times theta. Uh, that's close enough to A equals minus omega squared X. So it looks like omega squared is equal to G over L, and you can go from there and find the familiar expression for the period of the simple pendulum.